Pastor uh, Justin last week uh, start the series called Time Out by introducing to us the idea of taking rest as we're going into this new year. And he concluded his message by challenging us to be well seasoned. If uh, you were not here last Sunday, you can check it out on our socials and also our online platform. Um, if you were not here last Sunday or didn't have a chance um, to watch. This morning and the next few weeks, we're going to, uh, to try and break this down and, uh, and talk about what it means to be well seasoned and rest well. I believe that we are so familiar with the word rest that we kind of put a, um, a kind of less priority and a less intentional about it and less attention and to a point that we, we put less value as if we know it well that we're doing a lot of it. Well, I spend eight hours average, sleep at 10 o'clock and wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and start my day. I've already had a good Rest in bed. So it's called rest in your sleep. Before that, I come home from work. I get to um, put my feet up and enjoy a nicer cup of coffee. And maybe for some, put a movie on and just rest. Or maybe someone sit around the spa with a glass of wine and just watch the bubbles and enjoy. And it's called body rest. Well, last month I get to uh, rest for nearly seven days. Um, I got locked in the room um, because of COVID. And I didn't get to see the family, my grandchildren, and it was really a hard way to rest. Um, and when I came out of a, after five days, I couldn't find my way around the house. Uh, and it's called restrictive rest. You know, so some were just hanging on there for the holiday to, to be able to take a good rest. And after three or four weeks, you're coming back and you're a lot more tired than before you left. Yeah? <laughs> some of you are like, are like that. I don't have a job. I'm at home and I enjoy plenty of rest. It's called rest when you don't really want to rest. And then, of course, there is this big rest, and it's called R.I.P. <laughs> you know what it is. It seems like rest no longer a choice. It seems like rest becomes a situational, it's just based on, on our circumstances. Rest just becomes the last thing you do when everything else it gets done, and it's usually at the end of the day, Rest becomes optional. But when you look at the life of Jesus and the way he approached life and rest, we find that rest is more than just a recovery, a downtime. Jesus is concerned more about something that is a little deeper, and it's called finding peace in solitude. And this morning, if there's anything that you learn, just keep in mind those two words, solitude and peace. We go back to Genesis. Uh, we read in there that God created and completed our environment and, and, and filled with great detail and purposes. Then he created us, you and me, both male and female in his image, and completed us by breathing his own life into us. And then he took stock of his work and he said, this is good. And uh, it seems that our humanity was not quite an offensive to God to the point that he raised us higher than anything else all over living things to be able to foster some kind of growth. And our bodies are the vessel in which we mirror and reflect God to those he's planned to put around us while remembering they are also creating his image. And when we come to this gospel story we want to focus on, focus on this morning, 
it uh, talk about when Jesus sent the 12 to, uh, on a mission. And he sent them two by two, which provides for their need for community uh, as they do mission locally. But it tells them to take nothing else. Essentially, this is a giant trustful mission. It's doomed to fail. It's a big challenge. Upon their return, they get around him and tell him what they've seen and what they've learned, what they've done. And before they can finish their report and get a bite to eat, the crowds start coming, coming and going, but they start to coming around, uh, around them. And, and Jesus pulled them aside and said, come with me. Let's go to a quiet place and get some rest. So Mark's... 6, 30, 31, the apostle gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and told that because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. This is also very important because this call to physical rest happens on the same day that Jesus fed the five thousands, in order for that crowd to stick around and get fed spiritually, he knew he must feed them physically. And if you were involved in bridge or any of that, those wonderful work they do on the first day, here's a nice little text to encourage you all. Feed them physically, then spiritually comes later. Come with me and get some rest. You know, I love this story as I was reading this familiar story. You see, the disciples were, were, the disciples were out on a mission. Just got back about the assist feeding the 5,000, a big tick, great mission, on to another big mission, amazing work. The disciples did, didn't come back and say to Jesus, hey, we just done this, we, we've been out and, we, and we've been walking all day long, our feet are tired, our stomachs are running empty, and uh, we start to feel a headache and, 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 and sick, and, and, and therefore, leave us alone, Jesus. You know, surely, they would have been very hungry and tired. Maybe they got really excited and very proud of what they have achieved. Maybe they, they wanted to keep going on to the next mission because they're so passionate, excited. Maybe they were too kind that they didn't want to annoy Jesus by complaining to him. Interesting thing is, if you notice, that Jesus already know the next mission project. He knows it because he's already provided the resources, he's going to do a miracle to feed the 5,000. They didn't. So encouraging for us all to remember that we don't get discouraged because he's got it under control. He's got the next move. He's got the next project in his mind. <clears throat> Whatever was going on with the disciple at that moment, I got into the gospel of Mark, immediately Jesus responded, by not telling them that he did a great job. By not telling them to get ready and start prep for the, get ready the soup to get out. He didn't tell them that they did too much or tell them off for overwork. Didn't tell them that he's got the crowd under control. Instead, Jesus, in his compassionate, tender, loving, and caring heart, he simply saw their immediate need. He saw, he was concerned for their health. He knows that they have more work, important work to do yet to come. He knows that they have family to go back to. He knows that they're being pouring out and investing on other people, but nothing come back in. They must have been emotionally drained from people rejecting them and call them different names when they were on the road. They must have been spiritually tired and they started to lose patience and their focus and direction out there on the road. They must have been physically exhausted, running on an empty stomach and feeling dehydrated. They have not been eating and drinking instead, but they were just being a good Christian and didn't want to complain. You know, I can't work without eating. 
I'll get a stomach ache. And I cannot go on and without drinking because I'll have a headache when you're dehydrated. When Jesus saw his disciples recognizing their, their pattern of work, their rhythm of work, their pace of work, recognizing their work ethics, he saw an opportunity to warn them by teaching them a lesson. God has created us to work, and he created us to rest. As simple as that. We go back to our Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all the work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and, and made it holy. I think the disciples knew, knew this. They knew all about this. But in their mind, they default in some way to, the, to, the, to Sunday and they can't wait to rest on the weekend or go on a holiday. Their mindset is somehow based on a calendar day of the week instead of grasping the concept, the principle of rest in God's eyes and presence and how rest is a way of honoring God in our daily lives and not just a Sunday event. And if Jesus is saying, you know, guys, what you do for God today is as, is as important as what you do for God on a Sunday. Sunday is the day of the week, but Sabbath is a God principle of rest that applies to those who labor. The body do the work. The body needs to be healthy to do the work. And in order to keep the, the, the mission of God to accomplish, we need to make sure that you, uh, uh, you know, as best resource as you can be for accomplishment, you are well enough to make it happen with God's help and direction because God doesn't serve God. It's you and I. It's them. Therefore, guys, here is how it works. And he said, Work smarter, but not harder. I don't know where in the Bible it says that, but I think that's what he said. <laughs> you can still work hard and being smart. You can still work more and being smart. You can still be busy and make smart decisions. Uh, one day this week I was in the pool. See, I did my seven-hour sleep. I got up 5.30, 6 o'clock, and go to the pool. And uh, I saw my, 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 my friend at the pool. His name is Nagib. He saw me, and he said, Hey, Pastor, it's so good to see you um, here at the pool. And I say, Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be back to the pool. And he said, You know what? I hear people saying that they are just too busy. Yeah, yeah, I hear that too. That they do not have time to come. But you know what, Pastor? They have time. Everybody has time. They just made a decision not to. Oh, I said, Nakib, can I quote that on Sunday? Because I'm talking about that on Sunday. He said, oh, by all means. So he was very proud of encouraging me to keep going to the pool. It's a good thing to do. But perhaps the disciples were in the same mindset. They were too busy that they didn't make a smart decision to get their rostering right. I think it's uh, playing up here. Can you still hear me? They were, they, they were in the same mindset that they were too busy that they didn't make a smart decision to get their rostering right so they can take in turn to stop and eat for a, a, for a minute because they are as hungry as those that they're going to feed. To stop and pray for the people they feed and for themselves who are serving. To stop and take a Sabbath rest for it is the right thing, says God. 
In Exodus 20, God reminded the people of Israel to remember Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And just as Jesus instructed the disciple and us all to remember his death and resurrection, as we just did this morning, God did the same to the people of Israel. He reminded them through Moses that they ought to keep Sabbath holy. Through Moses, that is, they ought to withdraw from the weekly routine, withdraw from the weekly habit, withdraw from the mindset of the week, withdraw from the priority and the passion of the week, and so forth, and to set aside. And when you fast forward to Jesus' ministry, the idea of set apart, the idea of withdrawing to get rest for and to God is echoing everywhere in the gospel. He withdraw. We read that he withdraw. He withdraw. When things are going well, he withdraw. He withdraw. And he withdraw to what? He just withdraw. The disciple withdraw and sleep. He withdrew and spent time with God. And Jesus, in this text, wanted to teach his disciple what it means to disrupt the plan by changing gear and find peace in solitude. So my guess is that many of us are familiar with the word peace, and we hear the word shalom. But I'm not sure if too many of us are familiar with the word solitude. Let me explain. Three words. Seclusion suggests a shutting away or keeping apart from others, often connoting deliberate withdrawal from the world or retirement to a quiet place. Deliberate, voluntary, they want to do that. I have, some, I have several people who often, when they find out where I come from, from Tonga and told them about Tonga, they say, oh, that's the place I want to go. And some of them actually did it. They just sell their house. They move over to Tonga. They just want to escape from somewhere. And they even wanted to ask if I got an island so they can go and live in the island so they don't have contact with the outside world, but just enjoy and rest. That's what it is. Seclusion. Now, isolation stress, stresses detachment from others, often involuntarily. It just happened that you find yourself in a place that you're alone. You don't choose to be alone. You just happen to be by yourself. You feel lonely. And that's involuntarily most of the time. And there is solitude. Solitude implies a condition of being a part of all human being or, or being cut, cut off by wish or circumstances from one's usual associate, routine, normal work, if you like, regular work. So solitude is a breakdown version of what is said in Exodus. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sabbath, remind you, it's rest. Keeping it holy is to set apart. Are you with me? I'm sure many of you would know that. So when Jesus said, come away, come away with me, he was saying, you need a self-care. If you need to know what the self-care means and what to do, then make an appointment to come and see Pastor Diana. She's an expert on self-care. She's written material, a book on self-care, and I'm sure she'll help you. What it means to self-care as it is important. He was saying, be prepared to disrupt your plan, disrupt your day, and be intentional about setting, you know, setting, set apart a time to withdraw so you can experience peace. Solitude. Now let's unpack that word peace because you're, you're familiar with it. Did you know that the definition of the word shalom in Hebrew the root word of shalom is shalem. And one of the first uses of the word shalem uh, we found in the Torah in Exodus uh, chapter 21 and 22. 
in this year's 14 time. And Moses is, is here giving instruction to the people about what to do when someone causes material loss or in a case of theft or property being stolen. When that loss or injury occurs, the owner is responsible and is it's, it's considered to be lacking or not complete because they're meeting, missing something. When that loss or injury occurs, the, uh, the owner is considered lacking or complete. The one responsible was to make things right. In the translation in Exodus 21, Shalom is translated as make it good. Make it good, shall surely pay, make full restitution, or do restore. In the ancient Hebrew meaning of shalem was to make something whole. Not just regarding practical restoration of things that were lost or stolen, but with an overall sense of fullness and completeness in mind, in body, and in spirit. Getting excited? It speaks of what we can get so close to connect to, wholeness and well-being. This meaning of wholeness carries over into the word shalom. In Genesis 43, 27, 28, Joseph, remember the story, still unrecognized, uh, unrecognized by his brothers who threw him, um, get rid of him. And he was asking about their health and his father's. And this is what he said. Then he asked them about their well-being. This is from the New Kingdom, King James Version. And it said, is your father well? The old man whom, of whom he spoke, is he still alive? And they answer, your servant, our father is in good health and is still alive. The word shalom is translated as well-being. Well, in good health. All of it in one word, shalom. One more explanation. In Arabic, the word for peace is salam. It sounds very similar and refers to a hope of a world peace and the end of war. But meanwhile, the Hebrew word shalom goes straight to the heart of true biblical shalom means an inward sense of completeness or wholeness. Although we can also describe the absence of war, a majority of biblical references refer to an inner completeness and tranquility. So when we look at Jesus' ministry, I want to bring you back. His holistic ministry was about concerning for the well-being of his followers. He's concerned that they are well in mind because mind's making thousands of decisions daily. Concerned for the body as the body serves and gets things done. It's not the animal, it's not the technology. He was concerned about the spirit as the spirit brings God into everything we say and everything that we do. And when we disrupt the plan, we are actually changing gear, giving the body a rest that it needs to regain the strength that it requires. Help the mind to reset and go again so we don't lose confidence in direction. Create an opportunity for the spirit to commune with God and not be distracted by the task and work we do in the world around us. So I did a focus group last year as part of my doctor research study. And one of the questions was, when you hear the word health, what are you thinking of? And it was interesting, the diversity of responses from 34 faith leaders in the community, plus a few theologians, from food, <laughs> food to doctors and allied health to mental health and and, 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 and all of that. But there's one theologian who replied and he said, health is a gift from God. 
God has made us as healthy people and invite us to live healthy lives and health. And in his view, we are to live holistically with the W-H-O, not H-O. That's confused in the health sector. Holistically. And he says, as you know, our bodies function in ways that they are designed by God to function God has made us in certain ways with a mind and a body and a spirit and health is when our bodies and souls and spirit function in good, positive, and healthy ways as they are designed by God, not by man, by God. I love that. It's a gift from God. No wonder Jesus invited us into that space. It is not surprised that Jesus was concerned holistically for the health of his followers. And it's 11 o'clock. Beautiful. We're going to draw a conclusion because while you've got those two terms, I think it's important to see what the application of this, what does that mean for us? What can we take away from here as we embark on a new year, 2024? There are three things to consider, to take away in order to stay well seasoned 2024. The first is this, be prepared to disrupt your plan, or the plan. Don't wait till the end of the day, because you're not disrupting anything. Don't wait till work is done, because it might not get done before the end of the day. Don't wait till things are calming down, because it might never settle down. Don't wait till you find an opportunity because opportunity might not come and find you, but you have to create an opportunity. Don't let circumstances disrupt your plan like what COVID did. Don't let others disrupt your plan. Only Jesus, you make the decision to disrupt your plan, whether you're in a workplace or at home, or on the streets. Be careful when you drive. You can still listen to music. But be prepared to disrupt the plan. Secondly, be intentional about solitude. Don't just withdraw just to catch up on sleep, like what I sometimes did. Don't withdraw, withdraw and keep thinking about the things you just withdrawn from. There is not solitude. Don't just withdraw and do different things because that's what happens. We go on holiday, you're coming back and you're as tired or if not more tired. The idea of solitude or the Sabbath rest is to be in communion with God. And the next two sermons, you're going to unpack what does that all mean when we find ourselves in a place to come to that place. We go to church on Sunday to worship and honor God. God, Jesus, we throw and spend time with God. In practice, why not spend time with God? Sorry, I might not, might, might not go, I must not go down that track. I'll leave it for the next two sermons. But I want to take the third challenge here. Take time out and disrupt the plan daily. Not every second day or third day or once a week, or in a fortnight. Our calling while we have opportunity to live is to disrupt daily. I love watching the cross country runners or the cycling, the tour to France. They don't wait till they get to the end. Then they take their dreams. As they ride or they run, they get to drink on the way. Folks, we are on a marathon, a long stretch this year. And to sustain and accomplish a healthy ministry, a healthy relationship, a healthy mission, a healthy church, a healthy family, and a healthy individual. And have a well season. We need to keep disrupting the plan that keeping us busy, finding peace, 
in solitude. Take a moment, just close your eyes. Take a look back. Look at your life and ask yourself, what does that busyness look like in your life? How busy are you? How does your busyness impact your life, your relationship, your family? And how are you dealing with busyness of life? How hard is it to disrupt the things that you love and enjoy? Because even if it is a good courtly mission, how hard is it to disrupt? Any area to confess and to work on, I just ask you to bring it before God as I pray. Loving God, we, are, we sit before you and, and, and try to pinpoint an area in our lives that just need the touch of God to heal, to renew, to restore, to, uh, to change, to, to allow growth. But something stands between that longing and needing for change. Whatever it might be, Lord, we, we pray that you know the secret things that are happening, that are stirring in our hearts right now. We pray that you touch that place that is so complex and difficult so that we can wake up and know that it is a call and invitation from Jesus to come to a place to commune with you our Father. So God, we pray that you, that you bring that healing. We confess if we have been busy and focused on other things but not spend time with you. But Lord, as we learn from you this morning, may we go out from this place knowing that we can be more alert to what it means to disrupt what we do just to spend a, a time with you. So, Lord, thank you. Equip and teach us anything more not said this morning that we need to hear. I pray, God, that you do the rest. Uh, let us grow as we go from this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.